Smith. I am a historian of science and the director of the Center for Science and Society. And the center is really proud and delighted to be co-presenting this series on multi-generational and early childhood trauma uh, with Trauma-Free New York City. This initiative is really a very good example of what the Center for Science and Society seeks to support. Um, the center's mission is to bring together researchers, scholars, and practitioners across Columbia to participate in research and teaching that addresses challenges that can really only be understood and approached from multidisciplinary perspectives, from bringing together people um, around a topic of research or a public uh, 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 issue, a public issue like multi-generational trauma. Um, so we really look for um, objects of study and action that are nexuses for multidisciplinary work. Trauma-Free New York City is also support, supported in part by a grant from um, one of the center's programs, the Presidential Scholars in Society and Neuroscience, which supports collaboration specifically between neuroscientists and others, um, scholars and practitioners studying aspects of mind, brain, and behavior. The Presidential Scholars uh, Program also hosts interdisciplinary postdoctoral scholars, um, and we are delighted that one of our 2018 scholars, who we've just appointed, um, works on trauma-related issues. She explores cognitive, behavioral, and social changes in new mothers with and without past experience of domestic abuse. So she will be, I'm sure, um, very much integrated into this project. Both the Presidential Scholars Program and the Center provide seed funding for interdisciplinary projects and research at Columbia, including funding for undergraduate and graduate students and postdoctoral scholars. And the, the Center promotes interdisciplinary work between the natural sciences, social sciences, arts, and humanities through its six research clusters, through course development grants, outreach projects, and other interdisciplinary events open to the public, just like today's. Um, we very much hope that if you're interested in this event that you will sign up for our mailing list, which is out on the registration desk, in order to hear more about upcoming events, grant deadlines, and other activities of the center. And I'd like to really thank very, very sincerely um, Virginia Rao and the other co-organizers of today's lecture and to all the speakers um, participating in this event. This is really a kind of milestone in getting a big project like this off the ground, and we're just delighted to be part of it. So please help me welcome Virginia Rao. So welcome again. Um, my name is Virginia Rao, and I'm professor at the Mailman School of Public Health. Uh, I'm also Director of CHILD, which is a Mailman School of Public Health initiative um, for learning and development, and co-director, or I should say multi-director, of Trauma-Free NYC. Um, a word about the speaker series. Uh, just briefly, it provides educational um, and informational gatherings focused on the biological basis of optimal child development. The intent is to support and inform the trauma-free movement across the city and the country, a movement to transform how we understand and respond to early childhood adversity and the resulting toxic stress that dramatically impacts our brains, our health, and our longevity. Two words about um, trauma-free NYC for those of you who haven't really met us yet. Um, we have four basic missions. First, to serve as a resource for the creation of cross-sector uh, coalitions and collaborations to make New York City a trauma-informed city. Secondly, we intend to increase public awareness in the city of the factors associated with ACEs and trauma experienced across the lifespan. Third, we promote research and demonstration projects activities on meaningful solutions to mitigate the harmful effects of childhood adversity. And last, uh, our intent is to design educational training and service learning programs in trauma-informed practices at Columbia University and for the wider community. 
Today, we're very fortunate to welcome a distinguished panel uh, and moderator to Neuroscience in Action, a conversation about early life trauma and the brain. And I just want to um, have this uh, in the background, if this can go forward. There you go, just in case uh, you want to get information, um, which you can certainly gather at the reception afterwards, but to contact us. So our panel, um, we are extremely fortunate to have Dr. Kimberly Noble, who is Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Education at Teachers College, where she directs the Neurocognition Early Experience and Development Lab. She is a pediatrician and neuroscientist by training with expertise in the area of socioeconomic disparities in children's cognitive and brain development. Most recently, she's part of a national team of social scientists and neuroscientists who are conducting the first clinical trial of poverty reduction, which aims to estimate the causal impact of income supplementation on children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development in the first three years of life. Secondly, Dr. Nim Totenham is Associate Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychology here at Columbia, where she directs the Neurodevelopmental Affective Neuroscience Lab, focusing on the development of neural circuits that underlie affective behaviors across childhood and adolescence, with a particular emphasis on limbic cortical connections. In her work, she uses behavioral, physiological and functional magnetic resonance imaging methods to identify sensitive periods during which the environment has the largest influence on neural phenotypes. An area of major interest is to study the effects of early life stress and adversity on human brain development, including adverse caregiving. Our third speaker this afternoon is Dr. Kristen Bernard. Assistant Professor of Clinical Psychology in the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook. Dr. Bernard's research investigates how early life stress influences children's neurobiological and behavioral development and how optimal caregiving and preventative interventions may buffer at-risk children uh, from later problematic outcomes. In order to ask these very translational questions, she integrates ideas and methods across fields of developmental psychology, neurobiology, and prevention sciences. But she is particularly interested in resilience and how responsive parenting may serve as a protective factor, which I'm sure resonates with many of you. Buffering our children from the physiological changes associated with early adversity. And she works to tailor parenting interventions for children at risk. And finally, we have our distinguished moderator, Dr. Jay Gingrich, who is the Sackler Institute Professor of Neurodevelopmental Psychobiology and Psychiatry in the Division of Developmental Neuroscience at Columbia University and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Dr. Gingrich is trained as a psychiatrist and neuroscientist and studies the mechanisms that underlie neuropsychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety disorders. His work aims to understand how genetic and epigenetic factors affect behavior and intervening systems, such as circuitry, anatomy, and physiology. So I think you'll agree we're very lucky to have this very distinguished group. And I think we're just going to start off with uh, Kim Noble is going to go first, I think, however you've got your slides organized. Uh, and then we will, as a panel, um, Jay, Dr. Gingrich will be fielding questions. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here this evening. And thanks to uh, Trauma Free NYC and the Center for Society and, S and Science for hosting us this evening. Um, so as a neuroscientist, I have to tell you that the human brain has been termed the most complex three pounds in the universe. Um, and it's not hard to see why when we consider the fact that in the first few months of life, every minute we generate several hundred thousand new neurons or brain cells. But what I think is particularly fascinating about this brain developmental process is that it's shaped by early experience. So you may have heard of the use it or lose it phenomenon whereby uh, connections that are used frequently are strengthened, whereas those that are not are dropped or pruned. And it turns out that the brain is most plastic or able to make new connections early in childhood. 
Now, in my lab, we focus on family social and economic circumstance. And of course, a child's experience varies tremendously as a function of his or her social and economic circumstance. And so we can use these factors as a lens through which to understand brain development. And so I'm going to be talking a bit uh, this evening about poverty, which is one aspect of early adversity that uh, certainly, while not uh, encompassing all of trauma, is one circumstance that predisposes children to be more likely to experience trauma. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, what is poverty? Uh, well, poverty is a number set by the federal government that varies by family size and the composition, meaning the number of adults and children in the home. Now, interestingly, it doesn't vary geographically. So a family of four living here in New York City has the same poverty line set for them as a family living in rural South Dakota, even though clearly the cost of living is quite different in those two places. Uh, now, the current poverty line for a family with two adults and two kids is just under $25,000. And although it's quite challenging to imagine raising a family of four uh, on that amount, especially in a high cost of living place like New York, it's nonetheless quite prevalent. Uh, and as we know, growing up in poverty puts children at risk for a host of negative outcomes in terms of their physical health, mental health, and school achievement. And as I mentioned, it's quite prevalent. So the purple line shows uh, rates of childhood poverty over time. And we're currently hovering at around one in five. Now, when I talk about socioeconomic status, or SES, I'm talking about more than just poverty. I just told you that poverty is strictly defined based on family income, whereas SES is defined based on income, but other uh, characteristics as well, like parents' educational attainment, occupational prestige, and subjective social status, or where one sees oneself on the social hierarchy. And we know that childhood SES, when conceptualized in this way, tends to be strongly associated with a number of important childhood developmental outcomes, things like achievement tests, grade retention, literacy, IQ, and school graduation rate, to name a few. Uh, and in fact, the socioeconomic gap in achievement tends to emerge early and really widen throughout the early childhood years. Um, so the data I'm about to show you are from the British Cohort Study of 1970, which followed tens of thousands of students longitudinally, or children longitudinally, in the UK from about age two to about age 10. Now, of course, you're not gonna give the same cognitive test to a two-year-old as you would to a 10-year-old. So on the y-axis here, we have cognitive performance in percentile, or where children performed relative to other same age peers. So first, I'm going to draw your attention to children who started out at age two at the 90th percentile, meaning they outperformed 90% of other two-year-olds on this cognitive set of assessments. Uh, and these were children who happened to come from socioeconomically advantaged homes. So those children from higher SES homes who happened to be high early scoring children tended to perform above average throughout the course of childhood. Next, I'll have you consider kids who started out at age two at the 10th percentile, so outperforming only 10% of other two-year-olds, who happen to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes. So those children from lower SES backgrounds who were low early scorers tended to perform below average throughout the course of childhood. So far, nothing that I've shown you is so surprising, but what's perhaps a bit more surprising is what happened to what we might term those crossover groups. So next, we'll consider children who uh, also started out at the 10th percentile at age two, but who came from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. So those children actually rose in their relative ranks over the course of childhood, such that by age 10, they were performing at or even a little bit above average. And finally, and most disconcertingly, what happened to those children who started out outperforming 90% of other two-year-olds, but who happened to come from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds? So those children actually fell in their relative ranking over the course of childhood, such that by age 10, family socioeconomic background is actually a much better predictor of cognitive skill than is early cognitive ability. And just to make it perfectly explicit, it's not that these children, of course, lost uh, cognitive abilities. It's just that they fell in their relative rank uh, relative to same age peers over the course of childhood. Um, now, in my lab, we're interested in trying to understand how these socioeconomic disparities in achievement relate to underlying differences in children's brain structure. So, for example, one area that we and others have repeatedly reported socioeconomic differences in is in children's learning and memory ability. Uh, so, on average, children from higher socioeconomic backgrounds tend to show higher memory skills uh, at various ages. Now, we've known uh, for 50 years or so that uh, 
memory is largely dependent on this skill, this uh, structure shown here in green, the hippocampus. Uh, and we've also known for quite some time that on average, a larger hippocampus is in many cases associated with better memory. So we reasoned that perhaps we would see socioeconomic differences in the size of children's hippocampus. And indeed, that's exactly what we've found and that's uh, now been replicated in four independent labs across the country. So this is an example of how socioeconomic differences in achievement may be uh, supported or, or uh, explained by socioeconomic differences in the brain. But of course it begs the question as to what factors might be contributing to this gap, both in achievement and in brain structure. Uh, so, of course, we could think of many things, right? Differences in nutrition, differences in prenatal care or perinatal complications, differences in prenatal drug exposure, exposure to environmental toxicants like secondhand smoke or lead, uh, differences in the home learning environment or schooling, uh, and the difference that we're going to focus on today, namely differences in family stress. Uh, so as you might imagine, growing up in socioeconomic disadvantage tends to be associated with higher levels of family stress. And we know that when parents are distracted or depressed, family life is often characterized by conflict and emotional withdrawal rather than the kinds of warm and nurturing, supportive parenting that we know is so beneficial for children. Now, uh, work from my lab and others has suggested that oftentimes children from socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds have altered levels of stress hormones, notably cortisol. And work from both the animal and human literatures suggests that there are certain brain structures that are particularly responsive to differences in stress hormone or cortisol, notably the hippocampus. And so, uh, in my lab, we're asking whether socioeconomic differences in exposure to family stress might lead to differences in the brain, including the hippocampus, which might support differences in cognitive outcomes, such as learning and memory. And so, uh, to do that, we're taking advantage of the fact that uh, cortisol is chronically secreted into hair. And so we can take a very small hair sample one time in the lab and get an average measure of cortisol or stress hormone over the last several months. And so then we can ask whether we see socioeconomic differences in hair cortisol and whether hair cortisol differences might be associated with differences in the brain. Uh, so in terms of the first question, we are seeing socioeconomic differences in hair cortisol. Here I'm showing you data where uh, higher parental education is associated with lower hair cortisol in those parents. Uh, similarly, higher parent education is associated with lower hair cortisol in their children, even when controlling for parents' hair cortisol levels. Um, and finally, higher family income, or in this case, income to needs, which is simply income adjusted for family size, uh, is also associated with lower levels of stress hormone in parents. But in this case, we see this nonlinear relationship, suggesting that a little bit of extra income goes a long way in changing stress physiology in parents. Uh, now, what about the brain? Uh, again, we're finding differences linking uh, perceived stress with uh, brain structure. So here in a large sample of adolescents, we found that higher levels of perceived stress was associated with smaller hippocampal volume, as we predicted. Um, and in a, a smaller sample of younger children, we're again finding uh, links between uh, stress and brain structure. In this case, higher levels of parent hair cortisol are associated with lower, smaller volumes of children's hippocampus. So um, if we're right that socioeconomic differences in children's experience has cascading effects on brain and subsequent behavior, and particularly if stressful experiences seem to be accounting for some of these differences, it begs the question as to whether this work could inform interventions, and if so, what's the right level at which to intervene? So certainly we could imagine intervening at what I'll call the most proximal level, at the level of cognition itself through school-based interventions. Certainly this represents the most common form of intervention address addressing socioeconomic disparities in achievement. Uh, similarly, we could imagine uh, changing children's experience most commonly through parenting interventions. Uh, now, my colleagues on the panel are going to speak to some of these types of interventions, so I'm gonna save the details for them, uh, except I will say that as I think uh, they would attest, 
intervention science is really challenging. So it, it represents quite a challenge to be able to recruit and retain families in these kinds of interventional studies. Not to say that it's uh, not a challenge well worth taking on, but it, it is uh, often quite difficult to do. Uh, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to um, raise the question as to whether we potentially as a society could focus on uh, the most distal level by changing SES itself. Um, so correlational work suggests that small income differences can be associated with relatively large differences in children's outcomes. So for example, a small amount of increased income early in childhood has been correlated with increased adult earnings when those children grow up increased time spent in the labor force when those children grow up, improvements in academic achievement, and even some suggestion of improved health in adulthood. Um, but of course, as scientists, we need to move past correlation and ask whether differences in income could cause those differences. And to do that, we need to conduct the gold standard of uh, scientific studies, namely a clinical trial. Uh, so I'm really be pleased to be launching the first clinical trial of poverty reduction in early childhood, uh, along with a series of collaborators uh, in the social sciences at other universities. So uh, although the ambition is large, the plan is rather simple. Uh, our plan is to recruit 1,000 low-income mothers uh, from a number of hospitals around the country shortly after having given birth. Um, and all participants will be enrolled in an unconditional cash transfer for the first 40 months of their children's lives, uh, meaning that they'll be randomized to either receive a large monthly cash uh, supplement or a small monthly cash gift. And that cash gift is unconditional, meaning they can spend it on whatever they want. It's not conditioned on any particular behavior. Um, they'll, as I mentioned, be enrolled in the hospital shortly after giving birth. Uh, upon enrollment in the study, they'll receive a debit card that's preloaded, and that debit card will automatically reload each month on the anniversary of the children's birthday. Uh, so in this way, our plan is to study the causal impact of uh, of poverty reduction on children's cognitive, emotional, and brain development over the first three years of life. Uh, we'll be following them up with a phone survey at age one, a home visit at age two when we can measure uh, some aspects of parenting, including uh, stress physiology in the parents and kids. And finally, at age three, we'll be inviting the families into uh, the university setting to do a complete assessment of the children's development. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to say that this work is being funded by NIH and a uh, consortium of foundations, and we're planning to launch the study in the next few weeks. Uh, so how do we think that this uh, increased cash is going to actually affect these families? So we've got two main pathways we're hypothesizing. One, as you might imagine, is uh, we're calling the increased investment pathway. So this is the idea that with more cash resources, families will be able to invest in things like books and toys and trips to the museum, also potentially higher quality childcare, better housing and better neighborhoods. And the other, critically for our purposes today, we're calling the reduced stress pathway. So this is this idea that if moms are less worried about uh, keeping the lights on or paying that monthly rent check, that they'll be more able to invest in the kind of warm and nurturing parenting that we know is so critical for children's development. Um, so our hope is that uh, this study is poised to answer the question as to whether boosting family income can change children's trajectories for the better, having some potential policy implications. So we hope that we'll have the potential to provide direct evidence on the effects of poverty reduction on the developing brain and mind. And we're also hoping that we'll be able to inform debates on the generosity or cuts to social service programs, both existing programs as well as new ones that might affect millions of disadvantaged families, uh, including a number of social service programs that have been in the news lately, like paid family leave or the minimum wage. And so, while I would never suggest that income is the only or the most important aspect of, uh, of the developing brain, it may be the most manipulable from a policy perspective. Um, so I'm hoping that I set the stage tonight for uh, talking about the kinds of factors that might lead to increased parenting stress, subsequently resulting in trauma. And uh, my colleagues, Dr. Nim Tottenham and Kristen Bernard, are really poised to talk a bit more about the impact of trauma specifically on the developing brain and mind, and what we might do uh, to help prevent those deleterious outcomes. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I thank my lab members, collaborators, and funders, and I look forward to your questions uh, in the panel subsequently. Okay, good afternoon.
So the work in our laboratory addresses this long-standing question of how do we explain this enduring link between early experiences and adult well-being and emotional behavior. And uh, we focus on the development of the amygdala as being part of the link um, between these two endpoints because the amygdala is responsible for paying attention to emotionally arousing events and learning about what's safe and dangerous in the environment. So it's really well positioned to explain some of the adult emotional behaviors that we're interested in. But moreover, the amygdala is rich with stress hormone receptors and it retains its developmental plasticity for a very long time, which really makes it a good candidate for understanding how the environment influences brain development. In adulthood, the amygdala has strong bi-directional connections with medial prefrontal cortex. And medial prefrontal cortex is a region that incorporates information from not only the amygdala, but various regions of the brain that can synthesize that information for the service of coordinating and ultimately regulating some of the over-arousal of the amygdala. And we study this system during development because it allows us to ask how the child's brain is responding to changes in the environment. Now, the World Health Organization published a study from 21 different countries around the world showing that um, childhood adversities actually contribute to about 30% of all adult mental health disorders, and you can see the specific breakdowns here. Importantly, the authors conclude that these estimates might actually be conservative. Um, so what that means is childhood adversity is actually one of the leading causes of adult mental health problems. So today, I'm going to be focusing on emotional neglect by the caregiver. And the reason to do this is emotional neglect is a very common form of childhood maltreatment. But unlike things like physical abuse and neglect, emotional neglect is rather invisible it's harder to see some of the outcomes associated with this type of adversity, and therefore it's often overlooked by clinicians or teachers or, for that matter, the research community. Um, it's uh, often thought of as an absence of input, but this absence for a developing brain that's expecting a certain parental input is a major stressor for the developing brain, and in many ways, emotional neglect is a more pernicious form of childhood maltreatment. Um, there's a failure to receive the needed parent-child intimacy, support, and serve in return that are critical for brain development. And so often children are described as raising themselves to a large extent, which is really a significant stressor during brain development. So if we consider the absence of parental input as a major stressor, we can turn to the basic neuroscientific literature that's shown us that at the single cell level, the amygdala is very responsive to chronic stress. So the amygdala cell tends to exhibit amygdala hypertrophy and greater reactivity, um, which position, which really, you know, benefits the individual for identifying and dealing with future stressors or responding to future stressors in a faster uh, manner. But that's in stark contrast to what's observed in the neighboring hippocampus, which Kim just talked about, where chronic stress tends to result in decreased dendritic complexity and smaller cells. So this contrast between the amygdala and the hippocampus starts to give us a clue about how stress is impacting the brain. It's not impacting the brain in a uniform fashion, but rather it's informing the brain about how to respond faster to stressors in the future, but perhaps at the cost of other processes. So when this stress happens during development, one of the reasons why it's so potent is that those stressors are co-occurring with a sensitive period for development of the amygdala and its connections with prefrontal cortex. So I just want to briefly share with you some of our findings in uh, typical development um, that supports that view. So when we look across age here, we find that the amygdala has a very robust response to emotional stimuli like fear faces at younger ages, which makes a lot of sense because you're learning a lot about the emotional world at this young age. 
So despite this early reactivity that we see in the amygdala, we see a very delayed development of the connections between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. So what I'm showing you here is in the adult, we get this nice anti-correlated pattern between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. So when the prefrontal cortex increases its activity, the amygdala decreases and vice versa. It's very consistent with a regulated pattern, emotion regulation. In older and younger adolescents, we still see that anti-correlated pattern, but you can appreciate that the magnitude is greatly decreased, consistent with what we know about the slow development of emotion regulation. But what we were most interested in is in childhood, we didn't see evidence of that adult-like regulated pattern. We saw this positive connectivity. So that's to say that when children are on their own, they're not exhibiting this intrinsic means of emotion regulation at the neurobiological level. So taking these data together, if this is age on the x-axis, what we find is that um, the amygdala exhibits this strong reactivity early in life, but that's happening in the absence of these adult-like connections with prefrontal cortex, which we don't see emerging until the beginning of adolescence, which really makes childhood a very good candidate for looking for these sensitive periods in the brain when the environment can influence future development. Moreover, we have evidence to show that the nature of the relationship between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex during childhood is a very good predictor of how the system stabilizes over time. Um, so Sunya, Lupian, and colleagues have noted that it's the period of the most rapid change of brain development that heightens the opportunity as well as the vulnerability of that particular brain region to environmental exposures. So we've since become very interested in the environment in which the system is developing. And so it's certainly not developing independently in a test tube as our MRI scans often lead us to believe, but it's developing in a very special species expected environment, which is the parent. And in the human, the parent can be the mother, the father, the grandparent. This is a learned relationship. And humans certainly invest a lot of time into um, caring for their young. And this has led to notions like there is no such thing as a child, which is just a reminder that in order to understand human brain development, we really have to understand the environment in which that brain is developing. So I like to think of parents as providing a scaffolding for brain development, much in the same way that buildings during construction have scaffolding that direct its um, future growth. So we turn again to basic neuroscience to address this question of the intimacy between stress-reactive neurobiology and the parent. So this is work by Regina Sullivan, and uh, this is done in uh, rodents. But briefly, what her group has found is that there's this period during development where amygdala functioning is critically dependent on the parent. So when the parent is available in the nest, the amygdala actually remains fairly quiet, and that happens by the parent reducing stress hormones that would normally activate the amygdala. But when the mother is out of the nest, the amygdala engages and contributes to fear learning. So how that plays out is, um, in terms of behavior, is striking. So the workhorse of threat learning or aversive learning in neuroscience is um, aversive conditioning. So for example, in this group, if they pair a peppermint odor with a mild foot shock, and this animal learns this on its own, and you place the peppermint odor at one arm of a Y maze, the animal does more or less what you and I would do, and it will avoid that peppermint odor. And that's what's shown here, very few choices towards that peppermint odor. But if the learning happens in the presence of the parent, and the parent can quiet the amygdala, then you don't get um, avoidance learning. The parent blocks avoidance learning and instead promotes preference learning. So the animal will approach the peppermint odor. And if that sounds strange to you, um, this is actually developmentally appropriate because the animal at this young age doesn't have the ability to fight or flee from a threat. That's not a survival strategy at their disposal. Instead, attachment is the strategy. And so the idea is that early in life, the presence of the parent helps the preference learning systems or the attachment promoting systems trump avoidance learning or trump fear learning. <laughs> 
So we were very interested to know whether similar learning mechanisms occur in the human. And so we presented young children with a conditioning paradigm where the blue square would always co-terminate with not a shock, but an aversive noise, which is like nails scraping down a chalkboard. And the purple triangle was paired with nothing. Children learn these associations either sitting next to an experimenter or sitting next to their parent. Then the parent leaves and we place children in a human Y maze. So in the human Y maze, children enter a tent and they see the blue square here and the purple triangle here and they're asked to pick a door to retrieve a prize. And they're shown that the same bucket of prizes is behind both doors, but just pick a door. And they do that five times. So what we find in about 100, three, four, and five-year-olds is that when children learn these associations by themselves, they act more or less like you and I would. They're avoiding that blue square. But if the conditioning happened in the presence of their parent, then the avoidance learning is blocked, and although it's slight, there's a significance preference learning in the human as well. So importantly, this is, these are the same children whose behavior is switching as a function of the learning conditions. So this suggests that similar learning is happening in the human. So we had the opportunity to collect MRI images while children were presented with cues of their parents, so pictures of their parents' faces and contrasted it with somebody else's parents' face. And what we observed is during childhood now, as opposed to that heightened amygdala reactivity, children are actually showing a decreased amygdala response. So this is consistent with the notion that parents are effective buffers of this hyper amygdala response that we typically see in childhood. Parents uh, stimuli are also effective in strengthening momentarily that anti-correlated, that adult-like pattern um, between amygdala and prefrontal cortex. So in other words, without the children, without the parents, children are exhibiting this childlike, non-regulatory pattern of connectivity. But with their parents, physically, they instantiate this more adult-like regulated pattern between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex, and the strength of that is moderated by the child's attachment security with their parent. So um, what we are thinking is happening is that parents are effective in modulating this stress reactivity. Parents um, go away, they go to work, children go to school, and then they come back together. And that routine going away and coming back together is really important in toning or in training the system in how to operate once independent, so once the scaffolding comes down. So um, we've had the opportunity to ask the question about, so what are the effects of the absence of a parent, so the parental neglect? And we've scientifically um, pursued an extreme form of this type of neglect, and this would be early institutional care, so what we commonly call orphanages. And um, in the, sample that, the samples that we've worked with, um, all of the children have since been adopted by families. And this is adoption via international adoption. And I point that out because the families that adopt internationally, so in environment B, are a very special group of families who um, we infer have a great desire to provide care for their children because it's not easy to adopt internationally. So the environments A and B are drastically different from each other in terms of parental input. Put. So um, even in the best case scenario, even with the best of intentions, institutional care is a far cry from family environment. So children show significant initial developmental risks. However, they also show significant rebound in several domains of behavior upon adoption. As I'm going to show you, there's tremendous heterogeneity. So I think that's really important to say that children who experience different forms of adversity are at significant risk for poor outcomes, but there's um, development is not deterministic, right? So there's a lot of individual differences that I'll be pointing out. But the most common risk that we hear from parents is um, difficulty with emotion regulation behaviors. So the data that I'll show you include participants who were first placed in institutional care before their six-month birthday and adopted by their second birthday. So when we look at things like internalizing problems and externalizing problems, so internalizing problems are things like anxiety and depression, 
Externalizing problems are things uh, we often think of like attention or um, difficulty with inhibitory control. We see that f uh, previous institutional care is associated with a significant increased risk for both of those with um, large effect sizes. But I also want to point out that there's a lot of individual differences. And so much of our work is trying to understand what are the factors that differentiate the kids at different levels of risk and how can we understand how to reduce the risk for the children who um, are at the highest levels. So using structural MRI, we've observed that a history of institutional care is associated with a larger amygdala volume, but only for those children who had spent a year, um, at least a year, in institutional care. Now importantly, this correlated with internalizing problems and trait anxiety. So it was the children who had the larger amygdala volumes that were um, showing the most difficulty in these behaviors, whereas the children who didn't show those amygdala um, increases were not showing those um, same behavioral outcomes. In response to things like fear faces across two separate cohorts, we've identified elevated amygdala excitability following this type of early experience. But again, turning to the basic neuroscience, um, we were really struck with a number of papers that have shown in uh, rodent models, for example, that stress during development seems to do something different than stress in adulthood. During development, stress actually seems to accelerate development of some of these stress-reactive neurobiolo neurobiological systems. And that was, um, that was surprising to us at first because very often we, uh, in the literature, there's an association between stress and impaired function. And here, the suggestion was that stress during development may actually be facilitating some processes. And the idea is that when differences in behavior and brain occur following early stress, they may be best understood as developmental adaptations. Those are adaptations that happen during development in order to meet immediate needs. Um, but the question is whether there are potential trade-offs to consider. So are there longer-term costs that we want to be looking out for? Um, and so we have some evidence from our lab that something similar may be happening in children who experience parental deprivation. So these are the amygdala prefrontal connectivity data I showed you at the beginning of the talk, where children with a typical caregiving history show a more childlike, non-regulatory pattern that switches to a more adult-like regulated pattern in adolescence. We were able to replicate that finding in a separate cohort. But when we look at this connectivity pattern following early institutional care, in childhood now we don't see that childlike pattern. We now see a more adult-like pattern of connectivity between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex. So in other words, a six-year-old in this group has a pattern that might look more like a 16-year-old. So this effect is mediated by the stress hormone cortisol that we collected in the laboratory. But we're also understanding from the behavioral outcomes that this too may be an adaptation in children. So what we think is happening is that the, um, in the context of amygdala hyperactivity that results from this early potent stressor, um, the connections between amygdala and medial prefrontal cortex may accelerate through an activity-dependent process. While that may confer some benefits, the um, potential risk is that we might have abbreviated the sensitive period of childhood. So here um, are the data that lead us to think that this might be an adaptation. So although at the group level, early institutional care is associated with greater anxiety, the children that exhibit this more adult-like connectivity pattern have decreased anxiety relative to peers who did not exhibit that pattern. So to say it another way, the children here have a brain pattern that's most different from the typical group, but that difference seems to confer some benefits in terms of emotion regulation abilities. But on the flip side, we also want to ask if acceleration abbreviates plasticity, would that place limits on the ability of the amygdala to be buffered by parental stimuli? And at the group level, um, that's what we find. So these are the data I showed you earlier with the parent-stranger paradigm, where children with a typical caregiving history show parental buffering. 
At the group level, we don't see that same pattern following early institutional care. But I want to point out that these error bars are very big, which means that some of these children are showing evidence of parental buffering and some aren't. So we wanted to interrogate those individual differences over the long term. So um, we were able to follow children for over two years in this study. And what we found was that um, within the group that had experienced early institutional care, exhibiting that parental buffering at time one actually helped bring down anxiety over a two-year period. And when we asked, well, what was different between those kids that showed buffering and those who didn't, it was um, the, the factor that differentiated those was the child's reported attachment security with their parent. So in other words, the children who exhibited amygdala buffering at time one also reported having um, more feelings of security with their parent. And I think that's really important because it suggests that if we're going to care about children's brain development, we also have to care about the family and support the family in order to um, enact those changes. So to conclude, um, there seems to be a long sensitive period for environmental influences on amygdala medial PFC in childhood. So this gives us the opportunity to think about how the environment is scaffolding development. Parents are really primary social regulators of this um, amygdala PFC development. So parents really provide a privileged information source over and above other inputs. Early caregiving adversity does significantly increase the risk for poor mental health, but there are large individual differences, and I think those are meaningful and important to understand how to enact change. Um, and importantly, strong parent-child relationships have powerful healing effects well into late childhood and adolescence, as our data would suggest. So lastly, um, we think that early caregiving adversity may have its influences on the nature of brain behavioral and brain development by perhaps influencing the pacing of development. And so understanding brain development through the lens of adaptation may be the best route to understanding pathways towards change. So with that, I'll uh, thank the funding, the um, members of the lab that contributed, and the families and individuals that participated, and thank you for your attention. Okay, so I'll be talking about some of our work um, looking at the effects of early life stress on children's neurobiological development and how we've translated some of these findings to interventions that try to enhance parenting as a way to protect children in the face of adversity. Um, and so Kim and Nim have already highlighted a lot of different types of adversity, but I want to kind of overview some of them that we haven't talked about. Um, so we can think of adversity as occurring in a few different buckets. Um, one we might define as childhood maltreatment, and so this could include experiences such as physical neglect or emotional neglect, as well as abusive experiences. Also, in a second category, we can think of aspects of household or family dysfunction, such as growing up in a household with a parent who has a mental illness or a parent who's incarcerated or experiencing separation due to parents' divorce or just growing up in a, in a household with a single parent. And then finally, a lot of aspects of family or community um, factors that influence stress on the family level and on the child level, but also sometimes occur outside of the home environment, such as community violence or poverty within a neighborhood. And as has already been made very clear today, these experiences of adversity can really lead to long-term consequences across a number of domains, including mental health functioning, uh, physical health functioning, as well as aspects of achievement across the lifespan. Increasingly, there's been a lot of attention to trying to understand some of the neurobiological mechanisms, how the body is changing, how the brain is changing, because Understanding these pathways might give us new novel targets for intervention or help us understand how our interventions are working. And so the system, uh, the neurobiological system that I'm going to be talking about is one that we can measure by looking at saliva or spit. Um, and this is really helpful for us for understanding stress in babies um, because sometimes we can't use some of the other measures like looking at brain activity um, or, or asking babies how they feel. Um, and so, and babies have a lot of spit available. Um, so this is a, a nice 
method that we can use to understand how some of the body stress response systems are working um, with a pretty non-invasive data collection method. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical axis is one of the body stress response systems that's depicted here, or, or HPA axis for short. And this system is involved in mounting a stress response when we encounter a stressor in our, in our environment, um, and also um, has a diurnal rhythm across the day. And those are helpful to think about as sort of orthogonal functions of this system. Um, so the stress reactivity piece is one component, and that results in the output of cortisol, a hormone that um, Kim also talked about, uh, which can be measured in hair as well as through saliva. Um, and so cortisol increases when we encounter a stressor, and that actually feeds back to the system to help us recover after experiencing an acute stressor in our environment. But also, cortisol is regulated through a diurnal rhythm across the day, and the HPA axis plays a role in regulating or maintaining typical levels of cortisol. Uh, and this is what the, that rhythm looks like. So when we wake up in the morning, we have a peak of cortisol about 30 minutes after we wake up. Um, so it's highest in the morning, and that helps us mobilize energy and start our day. So that peak of cortisol is, is indicative more of getting up and starting our day rather than increased stress in the morning. And then across the day, that comes down to near zero levels at bedtime. So this healthy rhythm characterized by high cortisol when we wake up in the morning and low cortisol at bedtime is important for a number of functions in the body that have little to do with stress, although are often connected with uh, stress functions as well. So supporting daily metabolism, immune system functioning, healthy brain growth have all been linked to having a healthy rhythm of cortisol across the day. One question then that we've asked is how does stress interfere with this healthy rhythm of cortisol? Uh, what happens when a child is exposed to chronic stress or some of those different types of adversity that I highlighted? So in one study, we collected saliva samples from babies um, under three, so infants and toddlers, who had experienced varying levels of stress in their home environments, um, and then looked at that rhythm of cortisol from, from wake up to bedtime across three days. Um, so we had parents collect saliva samples from their babies, store them in the freezer, and then pick them up and assay them for cortisol levels. And what we found, as expected, in a low-risk group, um, these are just children from a community without a lot of stressors, they had that typical rhythm of high cortisol when they woke up in the morning and low cortisol at bedtime. Um, so this is a really healthy rhythm that reflects what I showed on the previous slide. Now looking at a group of children who were placed in foster care after being involved with Child Protective Services, we see that they have a blunted or low level of cortisol when they wake up in the morning, uh, and a less steep decline across the day really driven by that low waking cortisol. Um, and so this is potentially surprising to some people because you might assume if cortisol reflects stress, then shouldn't more stress lead to higher cortisol? Uh, but what seems to be happening here is a downregulation of this system such that cortisol is actually being produced at a lower level than it should be. And then when we turn to children who are also involved with Child Protective Services but stayed in their own homes, we see the most atypical pattern, which is characterized both by low cortisol when babies woke up in the morning, as well as higher than typ typical cortisol at bedtime. So what you see here is a low morning cortisol level as well as a blunted slope or decline across the day. And we've recently been interested in looking at some of these associations in a less high-risk sample. Um, so we recruited about 100 families near Stony Brook on Long Island um, that didn't experience neglect or child welfare involvement, but were varied in, in exposure to other types of risk factors. So for this study, we added together several socio-demographic risk factors, like having low income, a parent with low education, being a single parent, or having low, um, or, or being a young parent, and looked at that in combination with factors in the relationship that would characterize or may lead to stress. So having a caregiver who was not nurturing, um, or, or less nurturing than typical in response to a baby's distress, um, not responsive in play interactions or show low delight or positive regard uh, in terms of their affect during play. 
And collectively, these could be thought of as indicators of low parental sensitivity. And so if we put those together, having risk factors in the environment combined with having a parent who's not especially sensitive, that could be collectively thought of as cumulative risk. What we found was that cumulative risk, again, reflecting both high risk in the environment as well as low sensitivity in the parent-child interaction, uh, was predictive of, again, that blunted cortisol pattern from wake up to bedtime. So children that were experiencing that accumulation of stress um, were more likely to show this downregulation or blunting of their cortisol rhythm. And so a question, of course, is why care about cortisol, um, and we care about it because, as Nim and Kim pointed out, it really has an effect on the developing brain. And so when we look at behavioral outcomes, we've seen in previous studies that this blunted cortisol rhythm is particularly associated with externalizing behavior, like being oppositional and defiant and aggressive, as well as difficulty regulating anger. Um, and so this pathway suggests a target potentially for intervention. If we can normalize cortisol, we might see some changes in these outcomes that are really important for um, development, school success, peer relationships, and so on. A question, though, is where to target intervention. So um, Kim provided a really good rationale for targeting at the level of some of those stressors, so trying to reduce some of the disparities we see in terms of socioeconomic status. Um, but we can also target the level of parenting, as both of them have really provided evidence that parents serve as important co-regulators really early in life. So the parent-child relationship, especially during infancy, is so central to children developing the ability to regulate their emotions when they experience distress or anger, as well as their ability to regulate their behavior, um, as well as their ability to regulate on a physiological level. Um, parents are really the source of all aspects of regu regulation really early in infancy. And so I'm going to talk about an intervention that aims to enhance the parent's role as that co-regulator by building up parents' ability to be sensitive and responsive in interactions with their babies. So this intervention is called Attachment and Biobehavioral Catch-Up, or ABC for short, uh, and was developed by Mary Dozier at the University of Delaware. Uh, Mary was my graduate advisor, so a lot of the work that I'm presenting was completed in collaboration with her. And so this intervention is a 10 session, really brief intervention that's delivered in parents' homes. So it's 10 hours total, one hour per week for 10 weeks in a row, ideally. And it really narrowly focuses on enhancing the quality of the parent-child relationship. So there are three targets that we aim to address in the context of ABC. The first is helping parents be nurturing when their babies are distressed. That might include verbal support, checking in verbally, physical, soothing, um, or comfort. The second is helping parents follow the child's lead with delight. And this is something commonly referred to as serve and return interactions. When the child serves a bid for attention, the parent returns that serve in a way that's contingently responsive to the child's interest or cues. And then third, avoiding behaving in frightening ways. Um, so this is aiming to reduce behaviors that might be overwhelming for children, intrusive behaviors, or overtly frightening, like being yelled at or, or handled harshly physically. These three targets are addressed through manualized content that guides each session. So a parent coach goes into the home and has a topic that they're going to talk about each session. However, most of the action doesn't really happen from manual content or discussion. It really happens by coaching parents during their moment-to-moment -moment interactions with their babies. Um, so I'm going to show you some clips that highlight what those moments look like. That's very good nurturing to you guys, and that really lets him know he can rely on you, like he needs you guys. Oh, look at, oh, you're just doing all, you're doing the most. I love it, I love it. That's so wonderful. Great, Bobby. Please. 
Okay, so that baby had a lot of responsive um, partners there. Um, so what you could hear in these videos, in addition to seeing really sweet interactions, was you could hear a parent coach commenting on those interactions and saying that was a great example of following his lead or that's such great nurturance, how you hold him and rub his back like that, that's so important for him. Our parent coaches for this program are expected to make these comments at least once per minute. In an hour-long session, that means a parent might hear 60 times all of the positive things that they're doing. And that gradually throughout the session, we gently scaffold or coach parents when they're struggling to respond in these sensitive ways, but initially we're very exclusively focusing on the positive. And you could Think of why that might be important. These comments, for one, highlight in very specific, concrete ways what we think is most important in these parent-child interactions. So rather than just saying, good job, um, and the parent doesn't know what was good about the interaction, was it good that I labeled the color? Was it good that I let him play on his own? Um, we want to be very specific. So saying, good job picking up that block when he picked up the block. That's following his lead, and that lets him know, um, or that let, let, lets him know that what he's doing is important to you. Um, additionally, the focus on the positive is really important because for parents, especially parents who are stressed or have been involved with the child welfare system, you can imagine they don't hear very many positive things. Um, more often than not, they're hearing that something's a problem. And so having someone come into their home and really celebrate what they're doing well is a, is a, a huge shift in what they're used to. And so these comments and this feedback can be really rewarding. And over time, we expect that the feedback from the baby becomes what's most rewarding rather than the, the parent coach, um, but initially the parent coach's feedback is, is, is very important. So when we look at outcomes, we do see that we enhance sensitive parenting, um, and this is of course what we're targeting most directly, and so seeing this change is really important because it's a mechanism that we think should lead to other outcomes that we want to see, um, but isn't that surprising given, that, given how hard we're working to change it? We also see that this carries forward and reduces rates of disorganized attachment in these babies. Um, and for children exposed to neglect or abuse or even a high buildup of sociodemographic risk factors, disorganized attachment, which is a breakdown in the attachment system and the attachment strategy, is seen at really high rates. So the fact that a brief 10 session intervention can impact this is really important. And returning to what we started out with here, um, another question has been whether ABC influences these diurnal rhythms of cortisol levels in babies. So in our control group um, here, which importantly also got a 10 session intervention, also delivered in the home by a parent coach, just didn't focus on sensitivity, what we see is that blunted rhythm of cortisol across the day, such that they have lower than typical wake up levels and a flat slope. In the ABC group though, and this is within a few months of the intervention, we see that their cortisol rhythms are more normal than compared to the control group with a higher level of waking cortisol. And when we follow these kids for years after the intervention, so these data now are three years later, when the children were about four to five years old, we still see that more normal rhythm of cortisol across the day. And given that enhancing early attachment and early self-regulation should lead to other consequences that affect brain development and then outcomes related to cognitive ability or behavioral outcomes, we've tested some other outcomes associated with ABC and found positive effects on children's affect expression and regulation as well as aspects of executive functioning like cognitive flexibility um, as well as behavioral compliance. And also aspects that might point to enhanced school readiness, like higher receptive vocabulary at preschool age. Now when we take an intervention that's been developed and well tested in a research lab and move it out into the community, there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, for those of you that do intervention work, there's a lot of evidence of reduced effectiveness when interventions are moved from a research setting into the community. And this might be due to changes in who's implementing the intervention, changes in training and supervision, changes in fidelity, changes in who's being served by the intervention, but collectively we see this drop off in effectiveness. <laughs> 
And so some of what I've been interested in recently is how ABC works in a community setting when it's being implemented um, in a way that's less well controlled, although we still keep a lot of control over it. Um, and so I've had the great fortune of partnering with this fabulous group of people um, for, for an organization called Power of Two. Um, Power of Two is a nonprofit based in Brooklyn, but serving all of New York City right now and scaling up the ABC intervention. Um, and so this photo here shows lots of outreach workers as well as ABC coaches that are doing this work. And to date, I think we've served over 1,000 babies in New York City uh, over the past three years. Um, because it's a short-term intervention, it can be really be brought to scale on a level, level that other programs sometimes can't. Um, so ABC, through Power of Two, is being disseminated for infants in foster care, infants returning home from foster care, as well as infants in communities characterized by risk. And so some of the research we've been doing has been focused in Brownsville, which is a community in Brooklyn that has a really high child poverty rate. And I'll just highlight one outcome that we're seeing so far in an RCT there, um, which is looking at cortisol outcomes. And even in this dissemination effort with coaches hired from the community, some graduates of the ABC program themselves, we still see this enhanced cortisol regulation following the intervention, uh, which suggests that we might be able to disseminate this and scale it uh, and still see high effectiveness in the communities we care about. So in conclusion, I think collectively all three of our talks really point to the important role of understanding sources of stress for children um, and how that impacts children's neurobiology um, and also highlight several sources of protection, parents being one of them. Uh, with that, I'll thank you all for your attention and note uh, many collaborators and funding for all this work. And yeah, we'll move into questions. Great. So I'd like to invite the panelists up to the table and Dr. Gingrich to the podium um, to say a few words. Thank you. Um, so while uh, the speakers are taking their place, uh, maybe what we were going to do was invite members of the audience to ask questions if they have them. There's a microphone in back. Yes. And if you could just make a line in this uh, aisle here. Um, uh, and we can then direct your questions to the to the various panelists. Whoops. Oh, no, it's okay. So um, while we're waiting for people to come and ask their question, I, I guess I thought I would start. Um, and I wanted to thank everybody for your great talks. Um, it, it's, it's really um, a pleasure to see the, the, this level of science being brought to such an important topic. But um, I was thinking maybe from each of your perspectives, how do you imagine um, applying the kind of science to community um, outreach that we're thinking about with Trauma Free NYC? And how could we go about either through education or through intervention um, bringing this to uh, some sort of next level? Uh, and I, I direct that to all three of the speakers. Um, so I think um, uh, some of the work that I talked about pretty directly um, aims to bring what we've learned to the community. Um, but certainly partnerships, I think, are really important. And so Trauma Free NYC is a great example of that initiative to really connect people. Um, and connections to child welfare system, for example, is really important. So Power of Two that I talked about uh, is working with ACS to really get this into the homes of children that need it the most. Um, and there's a lot of community partners that I think we can collaborate with to really bring the science into homes. Yeah, you know, I would say we have to think about intervention efforts and then also education efforts, right? So there are intervention efforts that we can focus on parenting or on poverty and risk reduction. Um, and then there's also education efforts to make it be known to the broader community that um, 
Exposure to adversity leads to elevation in risk for a number of outcomes, including behavior outcomes and achievement outcomes that aren't necessarily the children's fault. And so by um, sort of broadening our effort to educate um, teachers and uh, school districts and the legal system, it potentially uh, could go further than any one intervention um, in, in changing uh, public perception of these issues. Yeah, I think, you know, similar to what Kim said, I think that one of the things that I'm excited about uh, for Trauma Free NYC is that we keep a heavy research arm involved. And the, the knowledge is so important in terms of where to focus efforts. And I think that identification of sensitive periods of brain development are really important to know about because it really kind of narrows the focus on where do we want to place the largest investments and to know that parents are so powerful to you know empower parents um, to think about how they're influencing uh, future outcomes is really critical and if we're going to care about parents then we need to think about how are we supporting families as a whole so if we're going to care about child development what are the strategies that we need to come up with as a community to provide support for families Thank you. And um, again, we have a microphone back here. I can continue to ask questions because I found this um, endlessly fascinating. And one of the things that, oh, um, so just um, if people could line up. Um, behind. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Have you thought about um, doing these presentations for people who work at the um, Administration of Children's Services in New York City? Are you doing that? Or do you plan to? Yeah, so Trauma Free NYC is uh, building up a partnership with ACS to try and um, use neuroscientific approaches to better understand how to help children and families. I also think the, um, the comment about being you know, non-judgmental and non-critical you know, when you're dealing with parents is very important. I am a social worker and had worked with the Agency for Children's Services and also before that, the Bureau of Child Welfare, and then a social worker in the school system. And all of the, that's another place where you could do presentations. That yeah. would be very helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's very you. good talk. Thank you. Hi. Um, I am a psychologist. I am from Mexico. And uh, we have studied this phenomenon for many, many years, of course. And um, I am interested in the in the experiment that uh, you are going to give money to the families. So how, how are these families are going to be selected? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, what would be the, uh, the requirements? Because uh, how, how do we know that this money is going to be well spent on, on, my, on children and on other things? Sure. So the question is, how will the families be selected for the uh, clinical trial of poverty reduction, and how do we know that they will spend their money wisely? Um, so in terms of the first question, we have pretty broad inclusion. So um, to provide informed consent, moms have to be 18 years of age. Uh, they have to speak English or Spanish, because those are the languages our interviewers speak and the languages of our assessments. Um, they need to live in the states where we're conducting the research, and that's because um, if we were to give mothers money, that might, that cash influx might render them ineligible for other social services like Medicaid or food stamps. And so we've uh, secured waivers in the locations where we're conducting the research to ensure that that won't happen. Um, and then they need to have lived uh, below the poverty line for the last calendar year. Otherwise, we're pretty agnostic. So we don't care, you know, how many, essentially we don't care how many children are in the home in terms of inclusion. Um, you know, we, we are not screening out based on things like drug use or what have you. That's part of the things that, some of the things that we're measuring, but we're not um, uh, hanging uh, inclusion or exclusionary criteria on those types of characteristics. Similarly, the cash itself is unconditional, and we could talk about the rationale for that. Um, but uh, although we are administering the cash via debit card, so we are able to track the transactions, we're not requiring that mothers spend it in any particular way. Um, Social science evidence suggests that low-income families, when um, faced with a cash influx, actually spend it in much the same way as higher-income families. And so although we hear that question a lot, uh, the evidence doesn't actually bear it out that lower-income families are more likely to um, indulge in adult vices, for example. And uh, 
we conducted a pilot study in my lab here in New York back in 2014 with 30 moms um, and found that over the course of one year, there were a little over 1,100 transactions, uh, debit card transactions in that pilot sample of which exactly three took place in the liquor store. So our pilot study bore that out, that it, it doesn't seem to be the case that low-income moms you know, squander the money. And, uh, in contrast, their interviews with us and the debit card expenditures suggest that they tend to use the money to support their families. Good luck with you. Hi, um, I work for ACS, so I appreciate the, the commentary. Um, and, and while I would say that um, there is a lot of conversations and movement happening around neuroscience and, and thinking about early childhood, I'm wondering what, what have you folks been doing or others been doing around addressing parental trauma? So the, the children we're talking about are stuck in cycles of intergenerational trauma and if we're not addressing the trauma that their parents have faced, how are we, you know, how do, how do we expect to break that, that full cycle? Um, and I, I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll answer from the um, basic neuroscience literature that's out there, and then I'm thinking that Kristen is going to be able to address this through her work. Um, but certainly, um, it's been shown now that um, traumas don't just stay in the individual, as you're pointing out, but they get carried forward through generations. Um, so for example, in, again, using rodent models, people aren't rodents, but there are some basic questions that we can answer. Um, it's been shown that early adversity in generation one can actually show up behaviorally in generation three, right? So that's um, a challenging message to hear. However, interventions that occur at generation one, ameliorative um, influences, also get transferred across time. So I think it goes back to the point that it's really important to not just think about the child, but to think about the family, to think about the neighborhood, and to think about the historical context in which children are growing up. So, Yeah, I think there are a number of different approaches for trying to reduce the effects of early childhood adversity, and some of them focus more heavily on parents and trying to address issues related to mental health or trauma, and some of those involve pretty intensive long-term interventions. Um, but there's pretty good evidence to suggest that short-term interventions can also be really effective at disrupting some of those cycles over time. Um, and I think that both approaches are really important to consider, um, especially because babies can't always wait for everything else to be fixed before they have a sensitive caregiver. And so if we can get in there and build up sensitive parenting really quickly as a protective factor, and then potentially or simultaneously through a different approach target parents' own history of trauma, um, that could be really um, good so that babies don't have to kind of wait till mom has it together before they have mom available. You know, we're actively testing whether modest increases in material resources can affect maternal mental health and parenting style. So I think we're all sort of on the same boat that a two-generational approach is, is really critical. Hi. So uh, all, a lot of your research, all, all of your uh, sort of talks were about sort of biological endpoints or sort of maybe more sort of, you know, near development and biological outcomes. So I'm very curious about the sort of the clinical trial that's upcoming or the dissemination of the ABC project, uh, is there opportunity or feasibility for sort of biosamples or biological endpoints, and, you know, so a lot of the research that you seem to be passionate about to sort of see whether uh, sort of the effect of these interventions actually translate to sort of biological change mm -hmm. according to these mediators or like childhood outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Sure. Uh, so in our clinical trial, we will be measuring stress physiology in both the parents and the children, so both salivary and hair cortisol um, in moms and kids. And then we'll be measuring children's brain function at age three using electrophysiological me methods, EEG and ERP. The hope would be to follow them longer term to be able to do neuroimaging when they're a little bit older. No blood or urine or any sample? Not yet. We would love to. Um, so, so far, we've raised $15 million for the, for the basic study, and then certainly our hope is to be able to expand upon that.
Thank you all for your presentations. I think while a lot of the um, brain chemistry information is new and really exciting in terms of being able to think about interventions, a lot of the uh, sources of trauma and deprivation have been going on for a long time and I'm and have been known, and yet policy changes in response to those um, factors seem never to come. And I'm wondering if any of your partnerships or planning um, have to do with somehow directly um, putting some energy into impacting policy decisions, um, I guess at every level mm -hmm. where yeah where we have policies. Yeah. So I um, just completed a paper that's directed towards policymakers to try and translate some of this um, information into practical um, suggestions. So I think all of us have probably done similar things like that. But at a more direct level, I think that's one of the things that we as a group at Trauma Free NYC are really invested in doing is being able to take what's happening here at Columbia, for example, and translating that to folks that can actually do things at a grander scale. So that's, that's, that's our main hope, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, certainly, the political climate varies, right, from year to year and uh, across ge geographical locations. Um, I can tell you that right now, City Hall is very interested in this kind of work um, with an eye toward policy implementation. So I think, um, you know, regardless of what's happening at a national level, there are frequently local governmental administrations that are thinking very carefully about how to apply this work to policy. Um, and with the ABC intervention in particular and Power of Two's work, ACS is a huge partner there. And so a lot of the um, source of support and referrals are directly coming from foster care agencies and ACS. And the scaling up across New York City of the ABC intervention really shows a huge investment of the city into that initiative. And I think there's always challenges of sustainability and funding and hopefully um, showing the effectiveness when interventions are kind of moved out and being able to show that change could enhance the buy-in of key stakeholders that you're talking about. Yeah, I think the buy-in is really important, right, because human development is very slow and it's outpaced by election cycles. So you need to, you need to have faith that the investment is going to pay off, but you're, it's not going to happen during your cycle. That's very hopeful. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question about your partnership with members of the medical community, like physicians. We've, I've heard a lot about school and parents, and obviously those are both really important levers as well, but I'm curious about the medical community. And then a second question I have is just regarding interventions with parents. I'm wondering, especially I guess for ABC, what sort of pushback, if any, you've received from parents who I imagine could view this as sort of a judgment of their parenting skills and how you handle that. I'll start with the second question. Okay, I'm happy to um, uh, so uh, it's pretty. So I initially, when I started doing the intervention work and actually going into homes, was expecting to get a lot more resistance than I got. And I think part of it is because how this intervention in particular is designed um, to be very focused on the positive. So it becomes hard to be defensive. Um, when someone keeps telling you you're doing a good job. Um, and so I think that positive support really helps break down some of that resistance initially. Um, although certainly the initial engagement in the intervention and wanting to enroll to begin with and have someone come into your home um, and videotape you because we tape every session uh, can be threatening at first. And so I think those comments really help reduce that threat initially uh, and build up a rapport with the, with the parent coach and the parent. Um, I think We've had more challenge working sometimes with foster parents who have a lot of experience sometimes in working with a lot of children um, and don't necessarily need the ABC intervention any less than parents who have lost their children into foster care, uh, but sometimes feel like they have a lot more training and experience. Uh, but still, the positive commenting seems to break down that resistance pretty quickly. Mm 
Um, and in terms of partnership with the medical community, I think that's a really excellent way to reach children, particularly in early childhood before they're enrolled in schools, right? Um, I think more commonly are the types of parenting interventions that focus on home visitation, but um, as Kristen just mentioned, it can be difficult to enroll families and, and keep them enrolled. And whereas um, over 90% of kids have a regular pediatrician who they see with some frequency, there's you know, 10 well child visits that are scheduled in the first five years of life. And so uh, those routine well child visits can be a very good opportunity to, to uh, inform parents about uh, these kinds of approaches. So for example, Alan Mendelssohn at NYU has um, a long-running intervention known as the Video Interaction Project where he provides parents with coaching in the context of the well child visit. We have time for one more question. And I'm interested in finding out um, in terms of your goals. In other words, what's your long-term achievement? Uh, the other thing that struck me is that um, you talk about it takes a village to raise a child. And, um, I'm not seeing maybe it, it's there in terms of involvement of the empowering the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what I think you are aiming at is really changing the, the environment. And within the home, that's not sufficient, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I, th I think your point is so important. And certainly when we talk about a child, we're talking about a child in a family. And that family sits within a larger community. And so the concentric circles keep building out. Um, and so again, I think one of the things that we'd really like to achieve with Trauma Free NYC is being able to partner with communities and empower community members to um, inform us as well about what's important and what directions we should take as scientists. Um, the, uh, the ultimate goal um, I think is, is very broad, but I think an important goal, which is to find ways that science can help um, all individuals live healthy and satisfying lives, both physically healthy as well as mentally healthy, if we know that there are things in the environment that are interfering with those personal goals that people have. Okay, so um, let me just take a, again this opportunity to thank our speakers, not only for their great presentations, but all the hard work behind them. And also to thank uh, Pamela Smith and the Center for Science and Society for helping us put this on, as well as Ginny Rao for uh, organizing this. And please, um, if you have other questions and you are afraid to get up and ask with a microphone in front of you, we're going to be adjourning to the um, area outside the, uh, the auditorium for light refreshments. So feel free to come up and engage our speakers. And uh, thank you, audience, for your terrific questions and your attention. Thank you. <laughs>